Uh, Michelle is from the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Electricity Human Resources Canada. Uh, I know I had conversations with uh, Jeff Dunstaff and uh, he highly recommended we get Michelle. So Michelle, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, for that kind of introduction. It's really a pleasure to be uh, presenting to everyone today, and uh, especially as you uh, celebrate the 50th uh, anniversary, I'm sure there was some good celebrating done on the weekend. So today I'm uh, speaking here and on behalf of Electricity Human Resources Canada, uh, or EH4C uh, for short. And so while many of my references will uh, naturally enough relate to what we see happening in the electricity sector, I believe many of the issues, uh, the challenges, and the opportunities uh, really are relevant to everyone uh, in the room. Um, and I know we have quite a broad uh, representation from a number of different different sectors. So a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are the only national electricity um, organization that uh, drives human resources and skills development uh, issues and talent uh, across the country. Our mandate is to address and identify the labor market challenges uh, that we're seeing in the sector um, look at the trends, what are they telling us, and then develop, deliver that labor market intelligence um, that really provides insights and practical evidence about the Canadian electricity sector. So what we do with that research then is we translate it into actionable and practical, I think practical is probably one of my favorite words, but programs and recommendations um, that address the HR issues that we're actually seeing. And those, uh, those issues, of course, impact operations, they impact budgets, um, and both talent management from a recruitment and a retention uh, perspective. So really our unique strength in our organization is that we bring many different stakeholders together around the table. Um, that includes, obviously, the employers, the employees, our educators um, at all levels, particularly post-secondary education, uh, labor, very important, and of course, um, federal and provincial governments. And of course, we all work together with um, those groups and other associations such as indigenous groups um, to try and help to plan for, uh, for the workforce that we know we're going to need. So really what we do is we, we see ourselves and we pride ourselves on being that H or um, uh, partner or uh, for all, the hub for all of the industry. Um, managing the electricity industry's most important asset, which of course is our people. Uh, and that's something that I think is very important. I talk to a lot of um, folks in our sector, a lot of CEOs and C-suite, um, and you know, there's a lot of excitement about capital infrastructure projects when something new is underway, whether it's a nuclear refurb or a new hydro dam or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the people to do that, uh, nothing's going to actually happen. Um, so some of the work that we've done over the last number of years includes uh, not only the labor market intelligence piece, but looking at legislation around marijuana, mental and physical workplace health, uh, succession planning, skills development, uh, and our groundbreaking uh, leadership accord on gender diversity. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit further on. But at the end of the day, we're trying to provide the industry, our employers, and everyone who works in it with the practical tools and strategies that, uh, that make a difference in workforce, workforce planning. So I'll start off saying by saying that what is true for the electricity industry right now is true for all sectors in Canada. And that's all about disruption. The accelerated change uh, pace of technological change, uh, innovation, demographic challenges, and to a great extent um, uncertainty have really influenced how people are thinking about human resources uh, and the people that are going to be required to support the Canadian grid in the 21st century and Canada Inc. So in our industry, you know, we're talking about, and I know a lot of this will be familiar from, from newspapers, the uh, smart grids, 
cybersecurity, um, carbon capture and storage, uh, the electrification of heat, the electrification of transportation. Um, those are just a few of the innovations that are reshaping the electricity uh, industry's landscape, and they really are also moving the landscape when we start thinking about the workforce and workforce development. And I'm sure that uh, many of you, without, without dating anybody in the room, um, will we'll understand that today's power generation um, is very different to what it was even 10, 15, 20 years ago. So now we have churches, we have schools that have solar panels on their roof. They are selling power back to the grid. Um, electrical vehicles are gaining traction and there's a lot of discussion of how quickly uh, we'll see electrical vehicles um, really penetrate uh, the market. But that's going to have implications, um, not really, not just for just the roads, but also for, um, and our driving habits, of course, but not just for how we even build our homes. So you think of, you know, 100 volt, 200 volt, you think of older homes need, needing to be able to support plugging in your car. You think of streets being able to plug in cars if everybody on the road actually has an electrical vehicle. There was a test a couple of years ago in Calgary where they did sort of a small pilot and they had everybody on this small street plug in and they blew the transformer out. So there's lots of learning as you go along the process, right? But smart grid, um, time of use, uh, battery storage, again, how do we harness power when you know, the sun's not shine, shining and the wind is not blowing? Um, these are all top of minds for our industry, our sector, as well as for consumers, everybody that is in the room. And of course, uh, global priority is to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's changing policies and regulations by governments at all levels, sometimes very quickly now as governments change back and forth. Um, climate change, you would have all seen the coverage of the, the recent marches that we had here in Canada, and we've had them worldwide. Um, that's really galvanized many Canadians, especially our youth, of course, um, and energy efficiency and uh, recycling is top of mind uh, for many. My own 10-year-old is constantly telling me that humans are killing the earth, and it's, it's all, our for, all our fault, basically. And of course, we see consumer demand for lower-priced, uh, low-cost electricity, and that's reducing in a need, of course, uh, or an increased pressure to actually reduce cost. So as employers, of course, it's also, um, it's also difficult to anticipate the impact of these changes. That's not all, always easy. And for individuals, um, so be that somebody who's in you know, the mid, mid of their career, the middle of their career, or somebody who is just starting out and looking to get their first job, um, that doesn't make planning very easy either. Um, I know in my own office, I have staff that uh, run the gamut from an age perspective, a wide range of ages, um, from some younger to some uh, my own age and a little bit older. And myself, along with uh, some of the older ones, have a, a real challenge sometimes keeping up with the, uh, the younger ones and their aptitude around technology. I've actually put a moratorium on any new technology coming in until Christmas because they've, they've put in place three new things this year and I'm still trying to catch up with them. Um, but uh, I would say, as one of the older ones, I think we can give the younger ones a run for their money when it comes to other skills. Communication skills would be one of those. Building relationship with stakeholders um, and not being afraid of the telephone. And I say that because I have a young and she won't mind, I've talked, I've talked to her about this before. I have a, a young 24-year-old, and she is phenomenal at communications and the technology. Um, and I would say, did you hear back from such a, such a person? She said, well, I emailed them two or three times, and they haven't got back to me. Pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. I started, are you afraid of the phone? Yes. They, this is, and yeah, so this is the sort of thing. I'm seeing this all over the place. So I actually spent a little bit of time with her, training her how to talk. And I said, you have to develop a relationship. You have to talk to people. We're all human at the end of the day. And so about three weeks ago, she came into our staff meeting and uh, she said, I talk to people. It's great. They actually want to talk to you. 
So yeah. So these are some of the challenges that you know we can still give younger people a run for the money, which is kind of fun. Um, so I think that's really important as well, is knowing that we are operating, working, managing in a multi-generational workforce, and that means we need to understand better um, how, to, how to work with together, and that really is an important skill in and of itself uh, in today's workplace. So what is happening in the Canadian electricity sector? Well, there are some days where you don't have to look very far. Uh, you just have to look at your window, right? Um, you know, weather issues are being felt all across the country. In Ottawa, where we are based as an organization, last fall we had six tornadoes uh, touch down, and that resulted in power outages, of course, across the city. Um, forest fires, uh, winter storms, they all appear to be increasing. And with that comes additional pressure on our grid. Um, indeed, our power line technicians are fast becoming uh, first responders. So this spring, we released our uh, report, Workforce in Motion. And that's our, our latest labor market intelligence study. We try to do these studies about every five years. And the data in the study actually um, provides evidence to support projections to 2022. So understanding what are the demographics between 2017, 2022, um, understanding what the labor market changes are telling us in the context of a very rapidly changing landscape. Um, and it really drives the work that we do on behalf of our stakeholders and our members to ensure that at the end of the day, our industry remains safety focused, absolutely paramount in our sector, productive, diverse, we're not there yet, but I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, and competitive. And again, I think the credibility that comes from the, the labor market intelligence or the LMI that we're able to conduct is that you know, we don't just depend on census data, we include it, and Statistic Canada, et cetera, but we actually go out to our industry and we talk to our employers, and we're, we are, have been able to manage uh, to capture over 75% of the employees working in the Canadian electricity, which is really phenomenal for a, a type of, uh, uh, of study of this nature. Um, and keeping up with the fast developments of uh, the labor market um, really is essential for developing policy uh, for organizations making employment decisions. Um, and it informs like needs analysis, also, um, it identifies what training requirements are there. It mitigates business risk, of course, um, related to human capital management. So we need to know what jobs are going to be under pressure uh, and when, because we, we do not want to be training the next generation uh, of youth for jobs that don't exist or are going to be sunsetting. And we don't want to have educators who are developing curricula for jobs that no longer will exist. And as people look to the future of work, um, we need to understand how technology is going to impact those skill sets and the jobs um, to make sure that employees remain current. I'll give you just one quick example of that. So I went to a government thing a couple of years ago and they brought everybody from electricity and oil and gas together. It was you know, really good generation energy. Um, and everybody was invited to come to it, whether you worked in the industry or not. And there was lots of discussion about jobs and the fastest growing occupation in North America, so US included, was um, wind turbine technicians. So we're, we obviously we're seeing a lot of growth uh, in wind. And so lots of talks about many, many, many thousands of jobs. But to build a wind turbine farm takes about 500 people. But to actually run the farm takes two. So there's a, there's a big gap. So that's why it's really important that when we're starting to talk about jobs and jobs that exist, you don't want 25,000 young people training to be a wind turbine technician if only a fraction of them are only actually going to get a job. So it's really important that we're having real conversations and we're translating that labor market research into language that is understood by not just policymakers or by employers, but by parents, by young people who are starting to think about careers in high school, et cetera. So I would say that, uh, and for me, of course, this is paramount, making sure that we are developing a, uh, a skill, a supply of skilled and agile workers for both today 
and for the future. And that really is critical to ensuring Canada's long-term electricity uh, stability and reliability. And that's powering how we work, how we connect, how we get to where we need to go. So there are thousands of um, Canadians who are actually running the, the Canadian electricity businesses, uh, over 106,000. Uh, it's actually, as a number, it's quite small in and of itself as a sector compared to some sectors like tourism, for example, where you might have five or 750,000 people. But of course, keeping the lights on and the power on is absolutely critical. So I always say we're a small but mighty uh, sort of sector because without electricity, Canada Inc. quickly comes to a stop. And there are, those people of course are uh, trades people, engineers, uh, line maintainers, transmission operators, uh, electricians, uh, power system operators, and they work in generating stations, they work in transmission companies, um, and distribution utilities. And though the need for those occupations uh, will remain um, to uphold and operate what we call our legacy systems, so the systems that are in place right now, supporting the emergence of new energy infrastructure um, will require workers to upskill um, and reskill or reskill while engaging in continuous and lifelong learning practices. So in other instances, we're going to see the emergence of entirely new skill sets, new types of work, and that's going to require specialized skills in our sector. You know, you think about artificial intelligence, you think about big data and what that means. Um, so which at the same time really needs to take advantage of human capabilities. I get a lot of people very worried about the robots are coming and what does that mean uh, for a sector. And yes, jobs will change over time, but uh, we're still going to need people at the end of the day. So I don't think we need to, to panic. Um, I'd also, as I may just... So as I referred to, I would position that every single sector, not just electricity, every industry, uh, every group that's in this room uh, really needs to ensure that you have that good labor market intelligence to draw from. And again, the information needs to be, um, needs to be accessible, not just to your, to your workforce but, uh, and your workforce planners or your policy makers, but it really needs to talk to what's happening in your sector right now, those you're trying to attract, as well as the people who are actually impacted and already working in the field. So our recent study um, showed that we did have uh, a sharp gap in labor supply and demand, um, spotlighting the need for over 20,000 workers uh, by 2022. So that's equivalent to 20% of the Canadian electricity workforce. Um, 15, a little bit over 15,000 uh, of those jobs is as a result of retirement, people who are, who are leaving, uh, leaving the, the, the industry, and almost 3,000 are due to expansion to ma demand or new projects. And then uh, there's a, the remainder would be due to death, et cetera, or illness, not on the job, but as a, just as a result um, of individuals. Now, the, the average age of retirement in our sector is 60, so it's quite young. Um, that has actually increased a little bit. The last time that we, we looked at this back in 2011, it was actually 58, but it's still three years younger uh, than the rest of Canada. Um, so we're starting to see the sunsetting of careers for many of the baby boomers. Um, that's, uh, that's underway. I won't ask everybody in the room who is eligible for retirement to put up their hands, but um, if you just look around and imagine everyone who could retire if they wanted to, and imagine this room next year, and you're not in it, what that room would look like. Right? So I think that's a pretty scary thought. That's a lot of, that's a lot of knowledge walking out the door um, for, many, for many people who have been many, many years working in a sector, right, or an industry. Um, on the construction side, um, of course, where electricity draws a lot of its occupations for, there's 12, there's about 12 occupations on the construction side that are used a lot by the electricity employers. And there's an anticipated retirement of about 255,000 workers in the trades, 21% uh, of the current workforce. Uh, and that's really the dominant driver of uh, hiring requirements 
over the next, uh, the next decade for both residential and non-residential construction. And that really is a significant loss of labor. So, you know, anyone that needs to do a reno, probably a good time to do it now. Don't wait five years because you're going to find it hard to find people. And I have to say, I'm from, I'm from overseas. I'm from Ireland and I was talking to my mother on the phone uh, yesterday and they have been having difficulty getting people in the trades for, for a number of years now to the extent that quite often you're waiting for two or three months to get an electrician to come in to do anything or a plumber, any, any, any of the trades, really, really difficult to get. Um, in Canada too, we are uh, right now um, currently experiencing the lowest sustained unemployment numbers, good news story, uh, since before the 2000 and 2009 recession. Uh, it's about 5%. And in the Informa Information and Communications Technology or ICTC um, sector, unemployment is under 3%. Now, in Ontario, we have some small work to do, uh, just to give an example, uh, to refurbish our nuclear plants. And Ontario Power Generation, or OPG, and Bruce Power um, will have parallel, do have parallel refurbishments underway. And that's, again, creating a huge demand for skilled tradespeople. So those companies are already having to work with each other to arrange schedules to try and minimize having the same trades uh, in demand at both sites simultaneously. We've actually even, I've talked to their CEOs, we've heard them speak publicly on this and really highlighting the risk that exists um, that if we cannot locate the workforce to do these jobs, um, particularly in the trades. Um, so in a way, while it was, it's always unfortunate to hear, you know, about risks on a project, it was nice in a way to see the recognition that is placed on the people that are going to be required. And the fact that if we don't have the people to do the job, we're going to be in trouble. Boilermakers and millwrights would be two of the trades um, that are severely under pressure in Ontario. We actually um, had a look around the country to see if we could pull into Ontario Boilermakers, as an example, I thought we'd be able to pull boilermakers from Alberta or so, you know, some of the where the economies are, are, are depressed right now and we cannot find uh, surplus of boilermakers anywhere else in the country and that's before any new capital projects are announced by a different company or by government in and of themselves. So the sector, um, and again this is going to relate to I think a lot of people around the room is on the cusp of an immense transformation. We have not been the fastest changing industry. It has been, you know, it all, electricity for the last 50, 60 years, the industry moves pretty glacially. It's nothing, the technology has already been there, no, no sort of real changes. Um, that's changing right now with the amount of renewable integration that we're seeing into the business. But that requires a change in how we, how we educate, how we recruit, how we train, and how we develop the people um, who's going, who are going to build and manage our system for the 21st century. Um, we're going to see training, um, we're going to see success defined by cross-training, um, as an example, between disciplines. We're hearing a lot about cross-training, whether it's about an electrical engineer having a, a degree in, in, mechanic, uh, in, in mechatronics, or having a tradesperson with two tickets. But this is the way we're seeing the industry go. These are the conversations that we're having in our utilities. And really what that does, it makes sure that employees have the skills that they need to handle both the legacy systems that I mentioned earlier, the next generation. Um, it also means that we can start attracting younger uh, and retaining younger people, a more diverse workforce. Continuous learning is going to be a necessity. Um, it's no longer, uh, even at this stage, um, you know, getting your ticket, getting your, your technical degree and thinking that's it, I'm done, I'm not going to lead anymore, uh, to need anymore. Those days are gone. It's, it's going to be all about continuous learning. Um, and I would say that professional skill, what we're calling professional skills, or what a lot of people in the past have referred to as soft skills, I think they're anything but soft, to be quite honest. Um, those are going to be absolutely critical. So when I think about what our employers are talking about, 
um, you know, critical thinking, communication skills, uh, as I provided an example a little while earlier, uh, the ability to take the initiative, um, collaboration, these types of skills. It's very easy to tell when young people come out of college or university nowadays, or they get their ticket, but they have the technical skills, it's not as easy to tell if they have what we call those professional skills. Um, and, and this is something that we've been hearing for about 10 years, and uh, I, I would say the, the, an emphasis on the importance of that has only increased every single year. So there's many jobs in the Canadian electricity industry. 42% of people work in the trades. So that's huge. That's the bulk of our people in the electricity sector. 22% work on the engineering side. So electrical engineers or technicians, uh, technologists. And then, of course, there are many others who are technically not STEM in the trades. Those who work in regulatory affairs, um, they work in uh, finance, in HR, uh, in customer service. Um, but every single one of those people plays a role in keeping the lights on. Um, we're actually addressing these skills at EHRC to guide members on their strategic approach uh, to talent recruitment uh, and, and management, um, including the need to review current competencies and, uh, um, and skills with a view to skills transferability. I think that's really important. Um, people have got to be adaptable. People are going to have many careers or many jobs in their career. I don't think you're going to see people going in and working in the same position for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Um, some, jobs, some jobs will no longer exist. In Ontario, a few years ago, we used to have meter readers, a person who would come around to your house to read your meter. Those jobs are completely gone now. So we need to be very much aware where are they are. Um, I referenced AI earlier, artificial intelligence. While I don't think that artificial intelligence is going to um, eliminate tons of jobs, um, it is going to have an impact. It's going to impact um, a portion of almost all jobs uh, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, depending on the type of work that it entails and the, and the variability of the task that's involved. Automation that now goes beyond routine manufacturing uh, activities, has the potential uh, in regards to the technical piece uh, to transform sectors, including electricity. Uh, and I, I think that would even include hospitals. I think we have somebody, we have people here from the, from the medical field as well too, from the nursing field. Uh, electronic records, for example, would be a way to do that. But I don't know if anyone's followed the debacle that's happened in the hospitals in Ottawa over the, over the last few months where they brought in the technology and I think the technology in and of itself will be of immense use, but they didn't train the individuals in the hospitals to actually use it. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of challenges there and there's a lot of ways in which people do not get it right. So again, we look around the room with so much institutional knowledge with uh, consolidated with the senior folks, the senior people that are retiring um, in our industry and many others faster than they can actually be replaced. Um, the need for effective succession planning becomes even more crucial than ever. And I really think employers need to have these conversations. They need clear planning on a pipeline from entry level positions all the way up to the C-suite, because without a plan in place, uh, employers are going to lose decades of knowledge, of crucial relationships, of experience, um, and lessons learned from organizations' most challenging experiences. Um, and our, our, in our sector, the, the data shows us that over 30% of companies have no succession plan, sorry, have no succession plans in place for management and more than 50% lack succession plans for non-management positions. And note that I said here non-management positions, because I see this with companies that have a nice little succession plan for the C-suite, for the leadership, but they haven't actually identified the critical occupations throughout the organization. 
right? So that's really important. Uh, and I've had, for example, out west, we've had uh, one utility that really wasn't paying too much attention to this, and it wasn't until they didn't have the tradespeople on the line to work that they actually had to drop a shift. And that's when it starts impacting the utility and money, and then that focuses minds pretty quickly, right? But it's not just a C-suite. It has to be all the way throughout your organization. Uh, it's not just electricity who are facing these challenges. It's not just electricity who is facing uh, retirements and, uh, and talent pipeline challenges. It's all sectors across Canada. And to spell that out, that means that all sectors are going to be competing for the same talent, the same pipeline. Um, even some of you in this room may be competing against each other. Um, it's other sectors that's actually going to make your job harder and making sure that you get the people that you need in with the right skills, the right place, at the right time. Okay. So the solution is to get creative about where you're actually drawing and sourcing your talent and, uh, and be open-minded about the type of talent that is actually coming in the door. So I want to talk a little bit more about just some of the LMI uh, things that we saw in the sector. Um, because we know that one of the other important considerations is all about recognizing and correcting um, underrepresentation in our industry. Um, in our sector, women, Indigenous uh, people, new Canadians, and other diversity groups are another solution to uh, fill the projected talent gaps that we know that we have. Um, the Canadian electricity generation, the industry itself is very diverse. Canada's generation uh, mix, energy mix, is very diverse. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of the actual workforce working in the sector. So today's, uh, in today's sector, we have just 5% of people under the age of 25. 5%, that's really low. 26% women, 5% indigenous people, and 3% of people with disabilities. So our industry has always required people who are highly skilled, um, highly trained workforce, and as the sector becomes even more sophisticated, um, demand is going to increase for employees uh, with diverse skill sets, diverse backgrounds, and different perspectives. We need to recognize um, and accept the reality that we have a lot of work to do. Unfortunately, today it's still frontline news when a woman achieves notable professional significance. So whether that is uh, the Prime Minister and it's his gender-balanced um, cabinet or the first female CEO uh, in a major utility, we're still telling those stories. Um, you know, the first to win an Oscar, the first to do this. We're still hearing too many firsts, women being the first to do this. And uh, we need to change that. We need to sort of imagine a world where it is the new normal is for women to achieve um, professional recognition and for girls and women to be anything that they want to be, whether that is a nuclear engineer, whether a power line technician, a surgeon, or a president. I watch US politics, so I've still got my hopes up at some stage. Um, so why is that important to an industry's bottom line? Um, well, the studies show that diverse teams, at the end of the day, in the workplace, uh, really do contribute to greater innovation, multiple recruitment and retention benefits, and increased employee engagement. Um, so there was a study there, I'm not sure if many of you would have seen it by McKenzie, um, that estimates that the greater efforts to uh, harness the power of women in the economy could boost Canada's incremental GDP by 150 billion, so that's not million, that's 150 billion by 2026. I mentioned the indigenous population at 3% in our sector. Um, we've seen some positive movement in the trades in electricity. Um, we're hovering about 8% now, um, but it's still not enough considering that this is the fastest growing population in Canada. And um, there's really a, a need to partner with more indigenous groups. Uh, to increase that Canadian participation, um, to have them in uh, the business all along the supply chain, even owning their own businesses and selling into, their, into the energy sector, um, I think is really important. We have a lot of opportunity 
uh, for Indigenous folks now who are very engaged in the whole idea of renewable energy. And, you know, the history of um, Indigenous relationships with energy um, and electricity employers um, hasn't always been positive over the years. Uh, and I think there's really a need to reestablish the trust and, and long-term relationships there. Um, the skills development discussion remains vitally important to both industry and the communities who want to build capacity for their children. Um, and there's clearly, I think, an opportunity for success based on mutual respect um, in that regard. And again, I think in our sector, as it changes, we really can uh, leverage our reputation um, as a source of stable and attractive employment and, uh, and tap into the social justice appeal of renewable energy, uh, which is sparking, as I said, fresh interest uh, in the industry and um, across a wide array of more diverse workers who see renewables as an opportunity to make a difference in the world, uh, to protect the environment um, and the climate and to improve uh, quality of life. So again, a compelling reason there, I think, uh, to increase the participation of underrepresented groups. Um, I don't know anyone who attends a lot of probably your industry conferences. I know definitely in, in mine, know that diversity and inclusion have been a, a theme now for, uh, for a number of years. Um, and it is a subject that requires you know, exploration, um, but we need to really get serious about talking, um, talk into action. I quite often go to industry events in the electricity sector where I would say if I had 300 people in the room, you could have 10 women. Um, I've gone to events where, I was at an event a couple of weeks ago where we had um, almost 300 people and we had about 15% women, the CEO told me, and I said, well, how many of those are actually the women at the booths? And a lot of the women were at the trade show booths outside, they actually weren't in, in the room. So we have a lot of work to do in this sector. Um, and a lot, of our, a lot of our employers have actually undertaken uh, initiatives and uh, action, um, but only 32% have an actual formal diversity policy or plan um, in place. Um, and the number of women, as I said, um, and those groups is, is still really low. On the supply side, because we not only talk to our employers, we also talk to our educators because they are filtering through that next generation, of course. Um, just over half of both universities and colleges have, uh, or other training institutions, have in place a recruitment program, for example, for indigenous people. So that means half haven't. Half are doing something, half are not doing anything at all. So I talked a little bit about uh, women. They continue to be very woefully underrepresented in the trades. Uh, in the electricity side, they're only accounting for 7%, and I would actually say that's really high. In our study, I looked at the figures, and I know that the majority of those are in the power systems operator, so it's not an, actually an external trade. Um, I know provinces where we have one or two women working in the power line technician field, one or two in a province in this day and age. That's a hard place to be for the, both those who are in the industry and for also attracting young girls and young women to that particular trade. Because if you don't see people in the trade, you don't, as a, as a youngster, you don't think about going into it. Um, on the accounting side, uh, we've made a little bit of a, an upwards trajectory, a big 2%. 21% uh, 20, of the workforce on the uh, engineering side. Um, so we're making a little bit, bit of, of change, but oh my gosh, is it ever moving so slowly. And I still hear from many, many people when I talk about diversity or rolling of the eyes or this doesn't impact us or we've tried, we've tried to recruit women to the trades, we tried something 10 years ago, it didn't work, we don't want to do it. Uh, we interviewed a few of them for trades job, but they weren't the right fit. Uh, they're not interested in working outside, it's dirty work. Uh, we couldn't find any women qualified to be on our board of directors. Um, I start asking really hard questions if a CEO tells me that they can't find a woman to be on their board of directors, or they have no women, no women working at all in their senior C-suite, their senior management uh, teams. So I, I don't accept that response as valid. Um, I do agree that it can be hard. Uh, I know that it can be hard in the trades. Sometimes we have, to, we have two issues. First of all, we have the recruitment issue. We want to get them in the door, and then we have to keep them once they get there, right? So um, 
I will say, just as an aside though, when I was doing some research, and I know I had talked to, to Kelly, um, I was delighted to see that when you were founded, uh, the initiative had both a man and a woman um, as part of that. So Kent Rowley and Madeleine Parent. Um, so from what I understand, two of the best labor organizations in Canada. So you're ahead of the curve from the get-go, which is good news, right? So one of the ways that we are working, I'm behind a slide already, not a big fan of PowerPoint. So one of the ways that uh, we're working is uh, to get employers to change this and to remove, just, you know, stop just talking about it, is with our, uh, our leadership accord on gender diversity, or the accord as we, we call it. And basically what that is, it's a framework that, ben that employers can use to benchmark their organizations and, and make measurable, measurable, again measurable, really important, uh, actual improvement. So for an organization that, um, that really cares about making change but needs a tool to actually do it, uh, the Accord makes a real difference uh, from the front line to the board boardroom in advancing uh, equality. Um, so what we do with the Accord, uh, which we launched here in Ottawa uh, in March of 2017 with Minister Monsef, um, is it's, it's, a visible, it's a visible commitment by our employers. It brings together employers, it brings together labor, educational institutions uh, to promote the values of diversity, equality and inclusion and to increase the representation, as I said, of women in the industry. And I know Jeff's not here today, but Cus W have also signed the accord, as have many of the labor organizations across the country. Um, you know, we actually developed this accord specifically for the Canadian electricity industry, but we've heard from so many other sectors or companies um, that also need something. This, we need a framework, we need a tool, we need to be able to some help to be able to do this. That we've had a number of municipalities have signed on the last couple of months, law firms, we're in conversation with some banks, um, we're very immigrant serving agencies. Um, legal firms, so we're quite excited about the depth and breadth. We're actually going beyond the electricity sector in and of itself. But because at the end of the day, um, when it comes to employing skilled workers, um, that requires more than just opening the doors uh, to, to uh, female employees. Um, you know, if you're really going to have a major change, a paradigm sh shift, that's going to require focus, attention, and metrics that can be used to measure change. So signatories to the accord, um, they're trailblazers. Um, as I said, united action, we can't do it on our own. Um, along with supporting women in the industry, along with equity, with fairness for the entire workforce. And this is what it does. It's not all just about women. It really serves as industry best practice to affect systemic change in a non-traditional sector for women. And I really do think that our, our signatories are bold uh, visionaries. Um, you know, they're looking at things such as governance, they're looking at tools, they're looking at their recruitment policies. And what they do once they sign is they have about three months to go away and their, their company, some of them take a few weeks, some of them take the three months, they work together as an organization to identify where are the gaps, where, and, to, and to measure where they are now. And then, after, and then they, after they do that assessment, that gap analysis, they set some targets for themselves. This, this, and again, it's not a cookie cutter approach, it's very dependent on the individual organizations and what they need to do. Um, so they're not measuring themselves against any other company, any other organization. They're actually just measuring themselves, their own progress. And they come back after two years and they see what kind of changes have actually taken, have actually taken place. And we provide signatories with a number of commitment areas to help them uh, with the process. Um, and again, it allows time and it recognizes that not everybody is starting off at the same, uh, at the same place and companies won't progress at the same place. Um, again, it's going to be tailored initiatives. You know, for some companies I've talked to, 
Uh, the biggest thing, that the first step that they realized was that they don't even have a diversity and inclusion committee. So for them establishing that, that's a first step. Other organizations who are, are further along with this discussion have put in place um, uh, the need or a, a policy that on all hiring panels, and usually there's two or three people on a hiring panel, will have a woman sitting at the table as well because that changes the dynamics uh, very quickly. And I will say this is not about affirmative action. I am not a believer in affirmative action at all. Uh, I do think it is about leveling the field and providing opportunities for women to have a seat at the table, a job in the trades. And it's a, it's a very actionable approach that we actually take. That we take. So just some of the ways that, uh, that people are driving change. I mentioned undertaking the assessment. I mentioned the policy piece um, to hold people in leadership accountable um, for setting and achieving these goals. Promoting the business case that comes along with, with diversity, that good diverse teams make good, good business practice. And um, for others, supporting the whole education piece, uh, career and awareness, for example. So um, going out to schools and colleges or universities, not colleges, but uh, high schools, I should say, um, for example, on having female staff go out and talk to the breadth and depth of careers that are available in the sector for women and the importance of math and science. And I often say that to companies. So instead of spending Joe to speak on behalf of your company, send Joanna. Because if you don't have a Joanna because you've just got 99% Joes, you're, you're, doing, you're not doing something right. Okay. I talked a little bit about the review piece. Um, and again, I said we've heard it's too hard, can't do it. Change is, change is difficult. Nobody likes change. We're always a, everyone's always a little bit of resistance to it. And yes, it is uh, hard. And cultural change is, uh, takes time and it takes uh, commitment. But at the end of the day, we're trying to define what success looks like and we're trying to move beyond talk and good intentions to accelerate the pace of change in our industry so that a discussion on gender is no longer required. I would love if I could go out to industry and not talk have to talk about anything about gender equality. Um, but anyway, we're not there yet. Um, I'm proud to say we have 80 signatories on the accord right now. It's going to be 81 tomorrow. I have uh, Transalta signing in Calgary. Um, and it represents over 700,000 employees working in Canada right now. So a big number. Um, it is the best club in town. And as I said, it's open to more than just the electricity industry. We've been sharing some of our practices with aviation, for example. The aviation sector came into our, our offices a few weeks ago to learn more about this. Um, so we're, we're really happy about this. The White Ribbon Campaign, which many of you may be familiar with, have signed on the other day. And uh, we actually had the opportunity to go to Taipei uh, at the uh, Apex conference just in August to talk to a number of different countries in Asia about helping them and supporting them um, with, the, with the accord. But building a diverse workforce is not just about adding more women to the equation. Uh, as I said, we need to look at all the under, underrepresented groups. Be it visible minorities, those with disabilities, uh, indigenous people, and youth. So I'm just gonna turn my attention quickly to youth, to young people. We talked about the fact that we're experiencing the lowest uh, unemployment rates uh, in decades, but our youth unemployment remains high at 15%. Um, and earlier in their education, and while they're making career changes or opportunities or choices, um, young, men, uh, young men and women are still pressurized to attend university versus the pursuit of skilled trades. We see this over and over and over again. And of course, we all know in this room, the trades offer great careers, uh, well-paid jobs that can climb into six figures um, with experience and advancement, um, as well as the opportunity if you choose to one day um, own your own business. Skilled trades workers build our schools, 
and our workplaces. They maintain the hydro systems that keep the lights on and keep our cities and our towns moving. They are the lifeline, literally, I think, of our lives. Um, and again, if you don't believe me, you've never had to search for a plumber, an electrician, a car mechanic, a uh, carpenter, the list goes on. And at the same time, many of those who choose to become engineers, technologists, uh, lawyers cannot find a job upon graduation. Uh, they can't land uh, an entry-level job with employers because, of course, employers want to hire people with experience. Um, I'm just going to go back to the trades piece. Again, from overseas, it's a very different perspective where I come from when people talk about being in the trades. If you tell somebody you're a carpenter, you're an electrician, you're a plumber, um, the perception is, oh, fabulous. You can run your own business, you have your own career, you can look after yourself, you're not necessarily dependent on an employer. In Canada, we still are pushing our kids to go to university and colleges, and it's still as if the trades is for anyone else who can't really get into colleges and university. And we really need to, to turn that, uh, that discussion around. So we are turning out at our post-secondary education system world-class, proficient graduates. Um, and they're ready to tackle the problems that we are seeing today. And we really do need to provide them with opportunities. Um, and we can start that progress, that, that process of supporting our young people while they're still at school. And so for us, we see great partnerships between our utilities and between our educators and our local colleges to develop that, that pipeline, um, to develop industry industry relevant programming because again we don't want our educators again as I said at the start developing curricula for jobs that no longer exist. Um, so in addition, in addition to, to the trades, um, one of the ways to, to bring on young people um, is to provide them with work integrated learning opportunities. Um, and this is really important because you know a lot of times youth might overlook your actual organization um, but co-ops, internships, um, Again, this is an opportunity to, to provide and identify that talent pool, that pipeline uh, for next generation. Uh, it's a win-win for the students. It's a win-win for the employers who's having an opportunity to try these, these youth out while they are still in post-secondary education. Um, and we actually have a program underway. I'm hoping to show a video in, in a second, uh, just before I wrap up. Um, where we're actually providing wage subsidies to employers between five and $7,000 for every student that they take in for a co-op or an internship or, or to work on a capstone, capstone project. Um, that's been phenomenally successful. We're going to put 1,700 students through in the next few years. We've already put almost 300 students through in the last year alone. Um, they're having a fa the students are having a fantastic time. We have one student who's actually working on merger and acquisitions for a second year student to actually have an opportunity to work on a merger and an acquisition deal with a big utility is absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, unfortunately for me, in a battle we haven't won yet, but we are communicating and talking with the federal government folks, is that they won't include the trades in the program as of yet. And for, for me, work in, the trades are the original work integrated learning, earn while you learn. And we know that our people in the trades are not going into the trades until tw age 27, so they've already lost a decade of, of uh, opportunity to, to work. So we're continuing to, to push the federal government to, to consider that. Um, I have an example where I've actually had a couple of companies come to me to ask about support through this program for a power line technician, female power line technician, the most difficult occupation for us to get women into, and we haven't been able to do it. So I'm going to show you a little video just to some people in, in there. Um, but I would think about how you brand your industry what story are you going to tell that young, that next generation? Um, again, for the, for the most part, electricity hasn't been considered sexy or innovative over the last few years, but now we're speaking to cyber technology, uh, drone technology, um, the security of the grid. Let me tell you, that gets a lot of young people uh, very, very excited. Um, and I know that adapting to all of these changes um, seems like an uphill battle. You're talking about the demographics, we're talking about technology, we're talking about the need to continuously learn, continuously train, you're never going to switch off. But I do think that um, you know, every opportunity out there, every challenge is, a, is an opportunity in disguise. Um, we really are at a pivotal point in our sector where we can either see ourselves evolve 
and reap the benefits, or we can struggle and ch against change and push back and say it'll take care of itself and be in a reactive mode. And I don't think anyone in this room can afford to be in a reactive mode. The, ch the, the industry, the world is changing too quickly, and disruption is the name of the game, and we need to be proactive. So as you go through, I know you have another day here. Um, I would encourage you to think beyond the technical, um, beyond the policy, beyond the infrastructure, and think about the people that are going to be working in this industry, um, to, and that makes your, your industry work, your jobs possible. Because again, and I'll say this over and over again, of any asset in a business, it's the human, it's the people that are working in it that are the greatest asset uh, and the most valuable. Um, we haven't been the most coolest place to land a career, um, but I think if we imagine a workplace and a workforce where our, our workforce is acknowledged as the best, as our greatest asset, um, we're going to succeed. I think if we tackle diversity uh, proactively, and I think it's all about uh, fairness at the end of the day. Uh, fairness has to be a key principle in everything that we do as we work together to build a workforce, not just for the electricity industry, but for Canada Inc. overall. Um, and that's uh, developing and maintaining a workplace that respects people and what they bring to the table every day and looks at them as human beings and regardless of their gender, their religion, um, color of the skin or, or where they come from, um, but on the value that they bring to the table every day as individuals. I'm going to show this video now if it works. Sky's the limit. Electricity is a product that everybody uses every day and we often don't think about that. What I love about this industry is that there are so many different opportunities across the country. Work integrated programs really are meant to bridge the gap between school and work. You might work with engineers, you might work with technicians, you might work with computer analysts, you might work with um, business professionals like myself. And the benefit for employers to hiring young people to come into their workplace is they get bright minds that have a lot of great ideas and that's where the opportunities are really in this sector. It's actually a different one I, went, I meant to play, but it's just a little bit that showed actually all of those young people that you see in there are actually students that are working and, and studying in the industry right now and are in post-secondary education right now and are taking it time to work with these organizations and try something um, and get some experience on the job, as it were. Um, it's funny, we had one young lad whose uh, biggest learning curve for the first few weeks was having to get out of bed early in the morning and actually get to work on time. So, and he reported that, it, and this was just a culture shock to him completely. <laughs> Some things don't change. <laughs> so you need to think about what makes your industry different and how you can attract people uh, to that sector, to your sector. Thank you, Michelle. Is there any questions for Michelle? Yeah. Um, well, Chris Lucy's, I work at a university. How are your conversations with like the universities, with colleges, with trade schools, telling them, listen, we don't have boiler makers, we're producing too many engineers, which is impossible, but uh, not joking, of course. You know, like how do you interact with people that are training the people to come in and say, this is actually what we're looking for? Because there is going to be that much lead time just to train somebody up to get them the skills that they need, they need to get that job in that industry. Two really, and two really good points there. You talked about lead time. So for a lot of occupations, whether it's nursing, whether it's on the electricity side, it's not a just-in-time industry, right? There's long lead times to full competency, so you know that you're going to have to train people before they're fully competent um, on the board. So we spent a lot of time actually working with the federal government on that, so understanding that we can't just have a whole load of people retire and three months later pull them in, or even six months. In some of our occupations, power system operator, you're talking four to six years for full competency. Nuclear operator, you're talking 10 years for full competency in a role, right? So um, so we, ha we engage very closely with the education. Um, colleges, the, the training institutions, the, the, the universities, we always have them represented on our board of directors and every single 
project or program that we run, we also have those same stakeholder groups around the table. So there will always be somebody from the post-secondary education system at the table, um, along with an employer, along with, or the people working in for employers and, uh, and the labor folks. A lot of times we work with IBW, we work with CUSW, we work with QP, we come with, work with IP, IBEW, and a lot of those are represent society of en en professional engineers or United Professionals, it's just changed. Um, so all of our work is, is, has that lens to it. Um, right now we have on the Empowering Futures project, we have uh, not only a, a national steering committee, we actually have a sub uh, subcommittee that's made up of 13 uh, institutions, post-secondary institu institutions around the country, and they all come together to talk about these challenges. And again, on the, on the LMI data that we do, so important that we go out and talk to the educators. You can't do just the demands, you can't just talk to the employers. What we heard from educators is that one of the biggest challenges, of course, is always funding. You know, getting, getting money for, for new training or the equipment that is required regardless of what the program is. Um, but the most important thing to educators is having that relationship with employers so that they can have these types of conversations. And so our educators use this LMI data as well too. They very closely work together. Really important not to, not to do one without the other. And we only project five years out. We've been asked before by government and by some other folks around the table, can we not do a 10-year projection? You're starting to get into crystal ball gazing there, as far as I'm concerned. So understanding the ebbs and flows and what that is going to look like um, is really important. Internationally trained workers, I think we are going to require internationally trained workers in Canada. Because um, the reality is, right now, and it's, it's funny because we're starting to have a bubble of, of youth being born, but we have had a bubble where there, we are simply not replacing the number of people in Canada. People are not having babies the way that they used to have babies. It's 1.97, I think, uh, nowadays. Um, so we're not, we're not even replacing ourselves. And that's a, that's a challenge and that's an issue. Um, but again, before we're even doing that, we should be looking at the population that's based here in Canada. So I talked, and that's one of the reasons I talked about that underrepresented group because there are so many women to pull from um, in Canada. The indigenous population, which is the fastest growing population in Canada and has the, you know, the youngest and a, a huge population. Um, so we, have, we do already have a wide array of people to pull from, but we need to be doing it now. We can't afford to be waiting five, 10 years. We need to be doing now. But I think internationally trained workers to a certain extent, we are going to have to pull in. Um, but this is why this, this whole topic has to be very top of mind, I think, for employers and understanding what the data is telling us um, and what, what can we do to, to sort of mitigate against it. One more question, uh, Sheila. Hi, I'm Sheila Ferrer from York University Staff Association. And Michelle, I apologize, I touched on this and I missed it, but are you doing anything with high school counselors that would uh, help with students who may not be the university level, but as a trade person, because they like working with their hands or whatever. Yeah, they go into those fields. Yeah, it's one of my, my dreams to do a little bit more. We've gone to CIRIC and we've to the Guidance Counselors Conference here in Ottawa and we've spoken to, to CIRIC and we keep engaged uh, to talk to the Guidance Counselors. I know a number of Guidance Counselors myself and I know unfortunately that what they're dealing with a lot of the time is not even talking to the kids about potential careers. They're dealing with mental health challenges. Um, they're, they're dealing with the... Uh, bullying that's going online you talk about you know cyber bullying and sort of things so they're not having as much time to talk to the kids about actual careers and that's a challenge and that's an issue uh, and so I would like to do more on that we have lots of ideas on the side of our desk it just comes around to, to trying to get it done but we very much engage and talk to them um, it's, it's really important and I think a lot of guidance counselors and I see this with high school teachers as well they have, they're trying to get a lot of information out, but they don't know what they don't know sometimes, and they don't know the depth and breadth of careers always that are in the various sectors. I have had one 16-year-old girl who wanted to be a residential electrician, and she was told by her teacher, because she was an A-plus student, when she went to that teacher to talk about what do I need to do next, um, don't talk to me about working in the trades, you're an A-plus student, you're going to university, and that's the only thing that you should be thinking about. That's the wrong 
messaging. We have a lot of educating to do with our teachers who sometimes with the best of intentions have their own personal biases that they bring to their classroom. Lots of work to do there. Yeah. So, I don't know, Tom, I know you had your hand up. Is it a comment or a question? No, I just was curious, uh, probably, I was curious how many of the of all the people that signed on to record, how many percentage-wise unions? I know you touched on some of them, but overall. I, I couldn't give you a percentage, but I could, I could get it back to Kelly for you. IBW has signed on, Power Workers Union, Society of United Professionals, Canadian of Union, uh, uh, Jeff. SW, Canadian Union of Skilled Workers. Um, there could be a couple more, but those are the sort of four big ones that I know we have on right now. So yeah, if anyone wants to sign on, more than happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank All you right. very much. So on behalf of the Confederation of Canadian Unions, we have a little gift for you. I know you have a you just got a tremendous schedule going up. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Thank you so much.